Uh, thanks again for coming to my session. It's the last session. You could have totally bailed out on me, but uh, so hopefully I make it worth your while. We got a good group in here. Um, it's first time coming to the Tri-State Forestry Conference. It's a great conference. I've had some great discussions with some of you guys. I love the passion you guys have in what you guys do. Um, just don't forget the evaluation like uh, Sharby just said there. Um, I have some great information. I'd like to finish it. So if we could just hold the, the questions till the end. It's not my normal way of doing things. I really like to walk around the crowd and, and ask questions and engage you guys. So it's kind of a new uh, concept for me to wait to the end. Uh, I inspect about 300, or I, the Iowa Department of Agriculture inspects about 300 growers uh, every year for uh, insects and diseases. And we also do a lot of uh, dealer inspections. So like the Home Depots, the Earl Mays, any of those kind of uh, nurseries that have trees and shrubs. Mostly just woody plant material, but we do a lot of greenhouses as well. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how to define quality. And that's kind of a hard thing to pin down, uh, the benchmarks. We'll follow the life of a tree from uh, production to, uh, to the landscape and talk about some of the issues that I commonly see in all those, in all those stages of its life. And <laughs> the, the all common, why is my tree dying? There are so many things that I think we see, but we don't see when we're out there in the landscape. We see it, but we don't connect the dots. Uh, we'll also talk about what's lurking in your landscape. Talk about a little bit of insects and diseases. Um, so what is quality? Um, you know, it's kind of a hard thing to define. When you look at a tree, you say, that looks like a nice tree, right? But sometimes it's hard to just say on a piece of paper, a benchmark, what is quality? What it determines the quality? So a lot of the time we define things by what it's not. It's not dead, that's quality, right? <laughs> it's not overgrown, it's not root bound, that's quality, right? There's no insects or disease problems, no mechanical wounds. It's got fairly normal growth. The tree matches the tag and you guys, I hope you guys laugh because more and more we see that because of the production uh, systems and uh, you know, we're just putting tags on trees. So you know, it's important to actually make sure that uh, the tag matches the tree. And a good one that sometimes we don't pay attention to either is the, tree, the tag may say it's hardy here, but that means it's hardy somewhere in, in the United States, but doesn't mean the tag is necessarily saying hardy for Iowa. Some of the, I'll, I'm going to go over, I have quite a few what I call soapboxes or pet peeves of things I see out there when I'm doing my job and talking to people. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I give advice to family and friends and it's amazing, they ask the questions, but then they don't implement the, the answer you give them. But uh, one of the things was uh, in the, the Des Moines Register, you know, I love these columns, don't get me wrong, my wife and pretty much all of our friends are pretty frugal people. And so it's nothing for us to stop along the curb and, and pick up something. But I don't know if we should be necessarily doing it in, in, um, with our nursery stock. Basically, the article said, save some green, head to the local nursery and rummage through the dumpster in search of rejects. With a little bit of TLC, most things will, be out to be, will grow out to be quite presentable. So who is taking care of these trees? We go from production all the way to, uh, all the, way to the installing in our landscape. And I like Dr. Seuss's, um, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So who does it start with? It starts with us, right? How do we determine who, what the box stores and all these nurseries are going to buy? If we stop buying it, will they stop putting it on their shelves? Most likely, right? So it kind of starts with us a little bit. I, you know, I take a lot of pictures. I'm so glad I have a smartphone because I don't tired of carrying a camera on all the time, but it, it just, it allows you to take pictures in random places that you would never think. Don't you love their watering system in some of the box stores? I, I really seen this. I don't remember if it was a Home Depot or Menards or something like that. I think because it's orange right here, I think it must be, <laughs> it was probably a, a Home Depot. But, you know, watering system. Who's taking care of these trees? Do they really think that's going to work? Down here the, in the bottom left, that's actually cultivation practices from an implement that they're trying to clean the trees. Look how s that thing is going around probably 100 times a minute. Um, and it's is cultivating. Look how close they're getting that tree. I was actually uh, I was there as an inspector 
when they were cultivating the trees like that, and they're just whacking the trees. And this is the kind of stuff that me and you probably see, but we walk by all the time. And if you think about this a little bit, that tree just came out of the ground, right? Slow down just a little bit. Slow down. Okay. Hold the microphone a little closer. A little closer. Can you guys hear me in the back now? All right. Sorry. Usually my voice carries to the back. I don't even need a microphone. So this is kind of new for me to actually have to have a microphone. But if you think about the trees, um, they just came out of the ground, right? It's about 80 degrees. They're going to be on an asphalt parking lot. What do you think that gets? 120 degrees. Just took off, sheared off all of its feeder roots. And now you're going to put it on a parking lot like that. Is that caring for our trees? How about this? We see this all the time. Does it connect to us that when you're out there at a swimming pool with bare feet, what do you do? It's, a, it's that, that concrete is like 90 degrees. What are we doing? We're getting to the water. We're getting our shoes on. Can these plants grow legs and move into the shade? That concrete gets about 140 degrees when it gets really hot outside. What do you think it's doing to the, all the roots in that pot? Just smoking those roots. See there, I was asking a question, and I'm so used to that, so apologize for asking a question. So this is a good graph. Nina Basuk and, and Widdock out of uh, uh, Cornell. I thought somebody's behind me. Uh, they, they did a study back in uh, 1987, and these are the different things. The, t the boxes are the tops of the cars, the circles are the asphalt, the triangles are the brick buildings, and, and the little, um, um, bas basically what it's coming down to is 122 degrees Fahrenheit at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we know that the roots are not going to tolerate that. So why do we have the pots on the ground? This is kind of some of the things I try to work with the nursery industry. Like, let's use some common sense. I know that it's, it's hard to do this stuff. But so basically, parking lot conditions, uh, asphalt, con uh, asphalt can get up about 122 degrees. The brick building is about 104. That radiating heat, remember, trees are used to having their leaves facing to the ground. When that radiating heat comes back up underneath those leaves, it's radiating underneath of those leaves and, and affecting those trees as well, putting them under duress. Uh, the leaves get up to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The soil can and get up to about 90 degrees too. Average soil temperature in the forest or is about 80 degrees. So that's kind of where they like to be. It's a pretty stable temperature. They don't like to be um, getting too much hotter than that. They start to shut down and die after that. So what happens when you have this, this heat on the, plant, on the roots in the pots? Uh, the new roots die, the older roots desiccate, dries out the soil faster, wilts the plants, stresses the plants out, loss of water in the leaves, stunts the growth, loss of any kind of symbiotic organism that's in that soil, and the, when the soil is dry, it, it can definitely increase in temperature a lot more rapidly. So if you think about it, really the roots are only the structure for the tree to hold it upright. If you don't have the feeder roots, you're getting absolutely no water, no fertilizer, uh, I'm sorry, nutrients out of the ground into the tree. And so they have these little things, it's called a rhizosphere. It's this little mucus area at the bottom of a, a root tip. That is its, that is its protection mechanism. It, it's a filter system that allows only the things that it wants in and they also usually are a rhizosphere where it's usually where it's symbiotic organisms like fungi will also be in this region and it's actually going out and grabbing stuff. When that temperature gets that hot, the, the mycorrhizae as well as that, that little um, cap right there, um, it, it totally sloughs off and it dies. And, you can water that tree as much as you want and it's not going to pull up any water because it doesn't have a mechanism to pull water out of the soil into the tree. So you basically have a Christmas tree in a pot. So when I work for Iowa Department of Agriculture, some of, I'll talk to you a little bit about the rules that uh, we use for regulation. Um, for bald and burlap, stocks must be kept moist at all times and must be kept in ho moisture holding material not toxic to the plants. And it's sufficient to the depth to the cover the top of the ball. So what I would suggest to you guys, if you are wanting to do something, go up to that nursery and say, 
I want you guys to take care of these trees if I'm going to buy stuff from you. The grassroots of you guys telling the nurseries, I want you guys to take care of it. You're an informed people that are saying, wherever, even if you're not going to buy stuff there, go there and say, you guys are just doing a terrible job of taking care of your plant material. I might buy something if you guys properly take care of it because when I buy it and I take it home and I plant it, I'm going to have a much higher success rate than if I, if I um, bought it like this and the, the trees, the roots are dying. The other thing is, I've, I've fought this for a long time, and I'm not abashed to say this, but all those, those roses that come into these box stores, a month before you can even put it in the ground, those are coming from a dormant, uh, dormant state. They wrap them in peat, uh, either last fall or early spring, from Tyler, Texas. There's about three companies down there. And this is just a good example. It's not so much that I think you guys are probably buying this, but it's a good example uh, of the stuff I'm trying to work with. After you get that plant in a dormant state, you put it in a box store in a, in a crate full of, full of other uh, plants, and you put it in, the, green, in a, the storefront that's about 80 degrees, it's going to come out of dormancy, right? You think it's really going to get any chlorof sunlight uh, in there and it starts to grow? And if it starts to grow, what does it need? It needs water, right? How is the box store going to water that plant when it starts to grow. And when it does start to grow, what does the, the, the top growth look like? It's white. It's no chlorophyll. So it's called etoilated growth. This is another one. You go to the box stores and you have all these uh, plants that are, you know, way too early to plant outside, but they're getting us because we have the green thumb. Isn't it exciting? The spring is around the corner and they get you. This stuff, it's going to die. There's no way. This just extruded all of its energy to say, it's time to grow. And guess what happens? It's expended all of its energy and has no left reserves. Once you put it in the ground, it's, it's just, you, you have to spend too much TLC with that. It's just not as very high successful. Tell your nurseries about this. Inform them. Tell your friends about this. Okay, number one, this is a production system failure. This is an auger tree. They auger the hole. They put the tree in there, they backfill some soil. Two months later, the next heavy rain, the soil settles. Too late, can't fix it now, right? So over a period of time, the soil levels over. And how deep do you think that is? That's about four inches too deep. So that's the, uh, um, that's the first failure in production method. If you go get your tree and that soil is four to six inches above the root color or the root flare, tree goes out like this. Once you start to see it to flare out like that, that's where the, the soil line should be. The next one, this is a very young tree, but look at that girdling root at a very young age. Our nurseries are not cult clearing this stuff out before they, they do production methods. They used to do this, they really did. And they're just in mass production anymore. And it's because of, partly because of us, why? Because we're going to the Home Depots and buying stuff that's so cheap, they can't be profitable if they can't sell it for a good price to, at, a, at a mom and pop nursery that's closing down. Number three, this is a bare root stock. Some, this is more and more stuff is being grown in a, you get it bare root and then you put it in a pot and it's like pot and pot production type stuff. But it really doesn't show up super well in the picture, but that's just a tangled mess of roots that it's, I mean, it has no success rate. I mean, it has a terrible success rate if it's gonna start out its life in a tangled mess like that. The bottom left, some of you guys in the back may not be able to see it, but you can see the, the scarring right there. That's either going to be from that cultivator, but I actually think this is sun scald. So what happens is on the south or the southwest side of the tree in the wintertime, it's nice all year round. It's, it's got its cambio flow going on and it's, it's just happy. In the summertime, that, cambio, that, that sap flow slows down or and the sun comes out on the south side on a nice cold day, but it heats up the bark, and then it kind of kind of gives it a sunburn, kind of kills the, the cambium, and then the next spring, it, that tree wants to grow out a little bit, and that bark splits, and all of a sudden, it's exposing the heartwood underneath, the, the hard part of the tree underneath there. As well, you can't really see it very well, but they also planted this one too deep. This is a couple years after they planted it. You could tell that I dug it down, put my pr pruners next to the tree to show you it's about four to six inches too deep already. 
A good thing, you know, you guys aren't necessarily in the field, but if you're, if you're walking fields like me, this is also another, another example of how I know the tree is planted too deep. See the gap right there? If you plant the tree like this and the wind is going back and forth, where's the pivot point? It's up at the top. It's going to flex properly. You plant it too deep and when it starts to flex back and forth, what is that doing? The pivot point's down here. It's making a big gap at the top of the, the soil line. So that's how you know that plant is planted too deep. Does that make sense? Sorry, I asked the question again, sorry. So there's the, there's the gap. Next one. This is a production. Uh, they have a whole bunch. They're trying to do the, the native plant system, which in, in pot and pot and air root prune and all that stuff. But if you're not moving that stuff, you're getting stuff too big and too small of a pot and you're not moving it onto the next size. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of investment. There's, these, these growers are trying as hard as they can to be profitable at stuff. But when the market shuts down, this is the kind of stuff happens. They're trying to figure out what to do with this stuff. They need to call it out, but they've spent their life with this. They're having trouble separating from themselves from all their work. But it's partly our fault because we're buying so much stuff. $13 billion of nursery stock is sold on asphalt parking lots every year from the USDA statistics. $13 billion from nursery stock. But yet we're still perplexed why our plant won't live in the landscape. I don't, it's, it's simple, but it's so far removed from our eyesight. We see it, but we don't understand it. Where, oh, where do I get my trees? I have a lot of friends, I guess, and I said family members, sometimes they don't listen to me, but uh, the retail and landscape versus the wholesale. And I know you guys are probably a lot of landowners that are trying to do timber, timber stand improvement and planting a lot of stuff. You're probably buying a lot of the smaller stuff. And so you're probably buying from a wholesale place. Generally, that's a really good place to get it because it hasn't lived long enough in a pot or something that, to mess it up. But make sure we are also planting those trees properly in the landscape when we're doing it. So that's going to be a legacy tree. It's not going to be a 15 years roots girdled, you know, weed eater eaten, mowed, mowed down plant. So we, we need to do that as well. But remember, uh, where are the mom and pop places? Again, $13 billion, we're buying it from the Home Depot stores. We need, we need to cha change our purchasing practices and the market will correct itself. I'm not saying they're at fault, I'm saying they're trying to make money and we're, having, we're hindering them to make money. Landscapers are not what they used to be. The professionalism in the landscape industry I don't think is there anymore, but at the same time I think it's coming back around. I think our market forces are driving us to have better quality landscapes, better quality plant material, better quality landscape designs, right place in the right plant, I'm sorry, right plant in the right place, and we are starting to move towards having a uh, more um, educated opinion of our landscapes and how we ma manage our landscapes. I think it's coming around, but support our industry. What is the cost of that tree? So a lot of you guys probably don't know this, but I'm going to give you a little piece of information. For the longest time, it's been kind of a, it's a, a, kind of a Walmart theory. Those, the, the growers own that plant material until it's ran across that scanner. It's called pay by scan. That Home Depot, Menards, Walmart, not all of them and not all plants, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of those plants that that Home Depot doesn't own it. They don't, they, they just, they just retail it for that grower. Once it goes across the scanner, then that, then that box store or whoever the retailer is reimburses them for that plant material. So anything that's dying on the property, that's why they don't have invested in, in, they're not invested in making sure that quality of the plant material is there. They actually have contractors come in to help make sure that that plant material lasts a little longer. So they hire a, sub, a, a second person to come in to make sure the box stores and places are taking care of this plant material at the Home Depot. It's not the Home Depot employees or the Walmart employees, it's, it's somebody else that's coming in to make sure that the plant material is properly taken care of. The cost of the quality trees, the educated staff, and the well cared for plants, it's worth the dollar. I'm frugal too, but if you want plants that are gonna be quality plants, that are gonna be well taken care of, they're gonna last you a long time, and gonna be legacy plants, it's worth the penny. So 
on kind of the next, this is kind of the ponder point of maybe sink in a little bit of what we've talked about and, you know, in your mind, what am I going to do to change this? It's kind of the aha moment, let it sink in. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about my, oh my, where do those bugs come from? Uh, some of the most common landscape plants, or I mean, sorry, landscape pests that I see are up here, and we'll cover each one of them quickly, but it's a flathead apple tree borer, the clearing borer, the honey locust borer, the weevils, and the scales, the mites, and the leaf hoppers. The flathead apple tree borer is probably one of the most common uh, landscape insects that I find both in production and retail as well as the landscape. The, the top right corner, that's the larvae, that's the, uh, the, 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 the immature stage of the beetle. The bottom right is, a, is the adult. Um, the top left, or the top two sides, that's the damage. So basically is what you're looking for is this is insect poop, or we call it frass. We like to have special names for these things. It's called frass, but what's happening is that the adult female lays the eggs in the crevices of the tree the egg emerges, crawls underneath, just underneath the tree, and feeds on that cambium, cambium layer underneath the bark, but they stay sneakily underneath of that cambium, and so they're feeding and feeding, and all that frass stays underneath the bark until the next spring, kind of like the sun scald. When the sun hits it, uh, it tries, uh, it, I'm sorry, the next spring when the tree starts to try to grow, the bark splits and exposes that frass underneath of the underneath the bark and the same thing with the bottom left this is this year's if you actually take a knife and pull back a little bit of bark you can actually see that it's darker colored but you can also see carefully if you look right here it's kind of an indented color and one way to actually tell it is if you water the side of the trunk of the tree it's a different color because it's dead so it's kind of a darker color if you if you hit it with water and that's the one way to to tell that it's got flatted apple tree borer in the landscape. Very common. This is what the tree looks like in parking lots, in compacted soils, in areas that have just not been taken care of. Mostly stressed, compacted soil. So the flatted apple tree borer, it's a beetle. It's very common in the landscape. It affects pretty much any deciduous plant out there. Uh, it affects, uh, it's a metallic green beetle, about three quarters the size of a penny. The larvae, like I said, overwinter, they emerge somewhere around the end of April and they attack stress, especially drought, uh, stress and transplant shock. The treatment's really easy if you time it right. And yes, this is one of the ones I would suggest treating if you find it, it's worth it in your land. If you're, this is talk your managed landscapes, not necessarily in your woodlands, but in your managed landscapes. The next one, and I, I know somebody asked me about a clearing bore uh, today. But uh, uh, this is a clearing borer, and you can see down here in that bottom right, it looks like a lot like a wasp, right? But it's not. If you open up the wings, you can see that it's clear, and so it's actually, it's actually a moth. Um, there's an oak clearing borer, and the summer oak clearing borer, and the dogwood borer, and the kind of the new popularity of the nine bark or physocarpus, uh, we're actually seeing a lot of dogwood borer in the new physocarpus that we're seeing up there, so just kind of watch for that. Again, the clearing moth, it's not a wasp, it's not a beetle, but it, does, it is a bore of, of trees. So the way you know that it's a, a clearing bore is it has frass being kicked out of the tree. And it ha if it's a big one or it's been there for a while, you can actually see it looks like dark colored sawdust at the base of the tree. And this is a good example. This is the nine bark right here. And this is the dogwood bore. You can see the the frass starting to come out, but you can see it's just riddled. It's got frass being kicked out all over the side of the tree. That is basically, if you take a straw, cut it in half, that's about what's happening to the, uh, to the conductivity uh, of the, uh, the, the sap flow and the xylem and the phloem in the tree. It no longer works once you separate that. So here's the, uh, again, here's a picture of the clearing borer, the moth. This is the dogwood borer. This is the larvae, it's kind of a white grub looking thing. And uh, again, the uh, summer oak or oak clearing borer. And here is the damage, you can see the extensive, that's about the size of a number two pencil. And this is what it does inside of that tree. It may not look extensive on the outside, 
but if you realize this is probably about one to two inches and it comes out. So what happens is the, the female lays an egg, the larvae goes in here, comes up here. When it, in the springtime, he comes back down, he kind of hangs out here until he's done pupating. And then when he's ready, he'll chew out the rest of the edge right there. And then this is the pupil casing that's left over when he leaves. That's the equivalent of the chrysalis of a butterfly or something like that. They leave that. So it's a really good tall tale sign that you have a clearing bore between the frass at the base of the tree and the, uh, the, the pupil casing coming out. Next is honey locust bore. I'm seeing as we're trying to diversify our landscapes, I think we're accepting that we need to have a lot more diversity. And one of the plants I'm starting to see more and more of, and I'm, I'm okay with it, it seems like a good alternative, but it's the honey locust, but it, we need to watch for the honey locust borer. It's, that's the adult, um, and if you look to find it in the landscape, if you look at the sap coming out of the tree, uh, it kind of has a little bit of a gummy substance that's coming out of the tree. That is a good way to tell that you have the honey locust borer. That right there, that little S-shaped thing, that is the tiny little larvae that this is right here. But you can see that there's two to four on a tree, same thing. You cut a straw, you separate it, the tree can no longer pull the water and the nutrients from its roots to the top and it can no longer translocate anything from the top down to the bottom. You've essentially, you know, cut, cut the, the multi-directional uh, flow of, of nutrients and food to the, to the tree when, you're, when they're feeding on the cambium. And that is the really tiny small hole that comes out of it. But remember, three to five of these can do a lot of damage uh, disrupting that flow and cambium. And again, here's a little bit better picture. And there's quite a few different agrilus bores it's really kind of hard to tell which one it is. They're all similar life cycles, so it really doesn't matter that much. But if you see the sap coming out, it's probably an agrilus borer. The other one that I see, and there's probably quite a few of you guys, if you have land, you're probably also making a little bit of extra money doing Christmas trees. Um, this is one, if you, especially if you're doing Christmas trees, that you want to know about. It's the weevils, or I call them the snout beetles or schnoz beetles because they have big schnozzes. This is the damage that they do. This is the feeding damage. Whoops, I meant to go back. So basically, on the, it, this is the mouth part, and right there, that's where his mouth part is. That's actually where his chewing mandibles are on the end of that, that beetle. So he has unique feeding damage. But when they come out, they, it's called maturation feeding, or just before they mate or lay eggs, they feed, and this is some of the damage that they do on the trees. And you can kind of see it because it's usually on the top side. It's usually on the south side of the, the tree. They like to sunbathe, so they're usually on the south side. And the, here's the, this is the, the all three of these beetles, the Paley's weevil, the white pine weevil, and the northern pine weevil are kind of hard to tell the difference. But again, their life cycles are so similar. They're separated a little bit by where the, what species they feed on and what time of the year, or I'm sorry, and, and the, where they're feeding at on the tree is a little bit different. Basically, most of the treatments are the same. But uh, you can also usually see it because of flagging. This will be last year's damage, the dead flags where, they fed, where they're feeding on. And, it kinda, and then you, once you, it kind of points, I was right here. So if you look there and you see some of that, that's a good sign that you had weevils. And again, the unique mouth part allows them to make little holes in the, in the, on the branches. And so when you have little holes like that, it's a good sign that the, that the weevil was there. And then this is kind of fun. They have a chip cocoon. So uh, these times, these weevils sometimes, most, some of these weevils are more likely to affect stressed or dying trees. And they call, it's called a chip cocoon because they actually uh, go in here as a larval state and they create this little um, frass covering and it's usually underneath the bark and you can't see it, but the larvae are there and then once they're done pupating, they'll come out of that as an adult uh, just like that. And so if you look underneath your bark and you see that, that uh, you know, straw-like straw uh, frass, I'm sorry, um, uh, cellulose material right there, that's how you know that you have the weevils. 
Next, we're going to talk to you about scales, but maybe not this kind of scale. I don't want to get on this kind of scale, but I will talk to you a little bit about this kind of scale. These are the, they're in the Homoptera family, um, and it's a scale, it moves, it's, it's a small insect that has a, a protective covering over the top of it, and they have little crawlers uh, that move, at the, they're under, from underneath the females, they'll crawl, and some of them will be very active and some of them won't. Some of them may move to like the, the new growth, and then they'll move back to a twig, and then the, the, they'll grow up to be a female, They'll have eggs again and continue the cycle. Some of them have one cycle, one generation a year, and some of them have multiple generations a year. So there's kind of the general terminology is you have armored scales or hard scales and you have soft scales. The armored scales usually have more than one generation and this is implications for treatment, timing of treatments and, and management techniques, um, but they don't have honeydew and I'll talk to you that, a little bit about that in a second. The eggs, over, uh, the eggs over winter underneath the female, and they're often very round. I would say this one is kind of a, it's not round, it's a bad term for round, but it's more of a rounded shape, it's not angular, but it has quite a few different forms for the armored scale. They're, very, they're much less active crawlers, which means they don't go to new growth and then come back, um, but they have a separate covering. Whereas the soft scales generally only have one generation a year, and they produce honeydew, and honeydew is basically insect poop again, it's some kind of an excrement that is coming out from underneath the scale, and if you ever see ants crawling all over a tree, it's basically they're, they're like honeybees trying to collect all that excrement that's full of sugars from the tree, left over from the tree that the insect wasn't able to process, and so the ants go there, and if there's a predator that's trying to attack the scales, the ants will attack the predator trying to protect the scales, it's kind of like a cash cow. Uh, they, whereas the, whereas the uh, soft scales, they overwinter as a mated female, ready for spring, and they're more like a helmet-shaped, you know, um, type of a scale, like, a, we'll talk about that in a minute, and they're much more active crawlers. They're the more likely to go from underneath the female onto the new growth, and then go back onto the twig, settle its mouth part into the tree, and, and harden off. So, the timing of scales for treatments is very critical. You kind of only have maybe a one to two week window of opportunity to treat them. Some of the scales you can treat with uh, a dormant oil, but a lot of these you're going to probably need to treat with other, something else. Some of these are economic and some of these aren't. And we'll kind of talk about that too. Uh, some of just, I'm just going to cover a couple of the scales. This is one is the oyster shell scale. It has many, many hosts. I find it in the landscape. Again, it's a stress. Uh, it, it loves stressed trees. I've seen many trees basically flocked, meaning in, there's so many of them on it you can't even see the bark of the tree because they cover it so bad. And remember that mouth part is injecting into the tree and it is just sitting there sucking out of a straw and the juice of the tree and it's just taking the vigor right out of that tree. So that's what happens is they get the branch dieback. Another one that I see a lot, especially on oaks, is the Kermi scale. Uh, it also creates a, a branch dieback, but it also has a canker, especially if you guys have a lot of red oaks in your landscape. And if you're mowing underneath these trees with your tractors and having compaction, and you're kind of whacking the trees a little bit with your cab or your tractor or doing that kind of stuff, that those branches are kind of being banged up. And a lot of the time the scales will set in. And once the scale sets in, that canker sets in behind it. And it's, it usually will kill off small branches it's usually not something that's going to kill the tree, but it definitely takes the vigor out of the tree. Some more, of the, some more things I was going to talk about is the, here's the ant. He's tending to the scale, the scale, the honeydew. They're collecting that. They use that as a food reserve. And this is what I'm talking about. The bottom left is a willow scale. It starts out with just a few on a branch. That is a willow tree. That is not the willow bark, but that is a willow tree full of scale, willow scale. It just basically crests over that tree and that will kill the tree. Top right, I'm seeing more and more of this. It's called obscure scale. It's on quite a few different hosts, but mostly on like red oaks and ash trees. And it's just little pin sized uh, scales. But again, it's cresting that tree and just take it, constantly taking the sap right out of that tree. The other one is the fruit lacanium scale. And that's down here. And it's just a very hemispherical 
um, looking scale, but you can see these are all the crawlers. It's not, it came out from underneath mom and they're trying to find a new home, but all those little things are all little scales, hundreds of scales coming out from underneath mom and trying to find a new home. There's a lot of good biological uh, control for this. Most often, it is definitely controlled by biological, con just native biological controls out there. But if the tree is stressed and the, if the balance is off, you can, those scales will take advantage of that and they will definitely uh, start to decline the tree pretty quickly. Next, we're gonna talk about spider mites. Uh, they're related to spiders, uh, but they're actually called acaria. Uh, the similar in shape to a spider, they start off with six legs, but then eventually they get eight legs as they mature. Uh, they're smaller than a pinhead usually. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they, if you turn over the leaf and all of a sudden you see all these little black dots moving all around, that's how you know you have spider mites. It causes, it causes stippling or bronzing of the leaves or the needles of the trees. And it's really easy to monitor if you just take a white piece of paper underneath the leaves or the, the needles and you bang on the top of the, the, the leaf or the needles and you look on that little white piece of paper and if there's lots of little gray black spots running around on that, that means you have spider mites. There are some beneficial spider mites, so they're not all bad. But if you are seeing the bronzing or the stippling of the tree, uh, the leaves, that is a good indication that you have not beneficial spider mites. Um, I, my wife probably laughs at me sometimes, but a lot of the time when I'm out in the field, just a simple 10 or 20 power hand lens, it's all you really need to see to identify probably 75 to 80% of the stuff that I look at and I can get it to pretty close identification just by field diagnostics this. It's usually just simple characteristics, but just having a run of these in your pocket or in your, um, around your neck is actually a very common thing that most nursery inspectors or, or diagnosticians carry around. It's a very powerful tool for the field. But the other thing I want to talk to you about is spider mites. It's very common for people to try to kill a spider mite with some of our common landscape uh, uh, insecticides. Remember, it's a spider, it's not an insect. They're both arthropods, but the chemistries or the modes of action of a lot of the insecticides do not work against spider mites or spiders. It has to be different formulations. So sometimes what happens is when we try to control spider mites, we're actually killing all the good guys and all the good guys are gone and it allows the spider mites to go rampant. And so sometimes farmers or, or uh, integrated pest management people will uh, or just lay people will actually go out and spray the wrong chemistry and actually makes the problem worse. Just make sure if you're going to spray for spider mites, if it's economic, that you use the right chemistry. Again, we'll talk about spider mites. The top right corner over there is the two spotted spider mites. You can kind of see the two black dots on its back. It's, it's a very, very common house, house plant, um, annuals, perennials, trees. Two spotted spider mite is a very generalist and it really, it really likes that hot, dry uh, climate. And if your trees are drought stressed on top of it, in a week, you'll just have completely bronzed plants. The other one, and I see is, if you see in this bottom left is the, it's a, it's, so it's got a, it, it's, a, it's a maple, but because it's got a red petiole, it's a red maple, right? So this is the stippling or the bronzing effect. It's basically, its mouth part is either sticking it straight into the, into the uh, epidermis of the, the leaf or it's kind of doing like a scratching motion and that cell collapses and all that juice oozes out and they just kind of eat that juice. And so basically what they're doing is they're collapsing the cells and then they're feeding on the juices which causes the bronzing or the stippling. And a good example of if you can't necessarily find the spider mites because sometimes they kind of do a good job of hiding if you look down here in that bottom right, I meant to put a circle around it, what, that is a cast skin, or it's basically when a snake uh, sloughs off its skin, it's, the insects do that when they molt as well, and it usually stays there even when the spider mite is gone, so you know that there was a spider mite there, and it's a good way of telling, even if you can't find the spider mites, you see the bronzing, and you see the cast skins down there, that you probably had a spider mite problem of some sort. Spruce spider mite, the the, 
the infamously used to be famous uh, dwarf Alberta spruce that everybody loved in the landscape because it was going to be an evergreen that was not going to get too big and it was this pretty little well-shaped thing. What happens is two, one of two things that's going on here is this is either a spruce spider mite or that's again the south or the southwest side of the tree that is getting the sun in the, in the winter time that's going to cause that or else it's the stippling from the, uh, from the spruce spider mite. And if you see in the bottom right corner, you can see all the, it, the green and kind of yellowish flecking and the spider webbing. That's a really good sign that you have spruce spider mite or two-spotted spider mite um, in, your, in, your, um, in your dwarf Alberta spruce. There's lots and lots of spider mites out there in the landscape. And again, some of them are good, some of them aren't. Make sure it's usually pretty good if you find out what the host is there's not a lot of spider mites that will occur on that particular host. So a lot, a lot of diagnost diagnostics is if you identify the plant, a lot of the time it really limits down the, the host that are occurring, uh, that are occurring, uh, or the, the pests that are occurring on the host. But I always like to ref reference that as insects, diseases, and plants don't read books, so we can't always go by that. The takeaway message, quality is cheaper in the long run. Low quality uh, will cost you more down the road because of inse uh, insecticides and fungicides and, and, and um, uh, nutrients. And buying from a reputable nursery is totally worth the cost. And storage and handling of our nursery stock is so critical. I think it's probably the last thing that we're not picking on in the, in the nursery trade right now is proper quality, care, proper handling and care of our nursery stock. It's just really not a hot topic and it really needs to be. And if we stop buying it from these places that don't do a good job of it and we go up to the store manager and tell somebody about it, it might change. But I've been sworn at by regional buyers because I tell them to do stuff and it costs them money and it's an inconvenience for them to properly put it into care. But you know what? I stopped having to do it as much because they stopped, uh, they stopped trying to get away with it and they just start off in the spring with mulch around it or it's on, a, it's on mulch or it's on a pallet or something to separate it from the asphalt. Um, they got tired of me calling them or stopping at them in the store and forcing it and they just do it now. At least we're getting a little bit of work done. But I'm one man, you guys are many. If you guys talk to them and tell them that that's what's important to you, they will change. Uh, thanks for coming and I'll handle any questions and feel free, this is my contact information, feel free to call me or email me with any questions you guys have. Any questions? What's the best way to get rid of the flathead apple tree borer? What's the best way to get, out of the, get rid of the flathead apple tree borer? Is it lands managed landscape? Yeah, it's in, in an apple orchard. In an apple orchard? Okay. Um, I don't know. Or, I don't know um, fruit, tree, uh, insecticides very well, so I'll probably have to plead the fifth on that one for fear of giving you bad advice. But um, a lot of the time, the permethrin, um, uh, permethrin is, is good. Um, basically, it's more about the timing with the flathead apple tree borer, and that's when, you know, the old-fashioned uh, spirea, the bridal re spirea, when they're blooming, uh, when they're just getting going good, that is the right time to spray for flathead apple tree borer. There's a lot of insects and diseases that are called, um, um, there's plant indicators, so the growing degree days of, of a plant when it's in bloom, magnolia, uh, uh, black wall or black or uh, uh, locust trees and catalpa trees, and we have a lot of indicator plants that tell us about how many growing degrees it is right now. Because every year is different, it's actually good to go based on an indicator because it doesn't read the the weather like we do. It reads the what's going on, and it's called growing degree days. So it's like a base 50. So every time it gets above 50, it adds. Uh, so many growing degree days and it accumulates over a period of time and there's a lot of things that are in synchrony between those two with growing degree days and um, the timing of when an, um, uh, an insect is emerging out of its eggs. There's, so sometimes it's, um, 
Uh, phenology is another word. It's P-H-E-N-O-L-O-G-Y. There's a great book out of Illinois, especially if you guys, um, McAdams and can't remember his name, but he's a, he's a legend with plant, uh, integrated pest management in Illinois. Has a great book if you're wanting to, if you guys are wanting to do that stuff. Um, how many of you guys are doing more of a managed landscape question versus a, a woodlands? I, I kind of wondered, yeah, yeah. I, I'm talking a little bit to a different crowd than I normally do or for my information, but I hope it was, I hope it was beneficial. Thanks again for coming. I know you guys could have bailed out and got on the road early, but uh, please make sure you fill out your evaluations. Have a great trip back.